This podcast has been brought to you today by StandingTollNZ.org. Welcome to the podcast. How, you, how are you? How's the water flowing? I'm feeling good, brother. Good to see you. Water is flowing. Um, yeah, welcome to my humble abode once again. Mm, it's yeah. a stunning fuddy, brother, down here in Arawahi. By way of introduction, uh, tell us something about yourself. Um, cheer, brother. Kala te whanau. Um, my name's Morgan Hawkins. Um, I'm from Arawahi. I was brought up in Hamilton. Um, been a youth worker for a long time now, been in the youth space for a while, um, my journey started, um, as a young person going through a youth, youth group at, um, Fiawire Arangatahi, um, called Fat Pack, and then it evolved into this thing called Brotherhood, and then eventually I become like a tuakana in that space, uh, the facilitator saw, um, I don't know, greatness in me, I suppose. Mm. Uh, so they put me up into like a tour kind of level type thing. They trusted me. I eventually started volunteering for them. Um, I got a job there like a like few years later, which was unexpected because I was being a chef. Uh, and then I jumped into the youth space as a worker, as a facilitator in, I don't know, high schools mm. around mm. Wakato. Mm-hmm. Um, teaching sexual education um, and then I was on and off with my uh, chefing career and then I ended up at Te Runangao Kirikiriroa where I work at a, uh, a remand home for youth, for young mm. people mm. that have um, yeah, sort of right. going through hard times so yeah, that's a bit about me So that's a good summary of where you've been yeah, from so take us all the way back. What are some of the earliest memories that you have growing up? Mm, I've had quite a lavish lifestyle, finally. Um, <laughs> what does that actually mean, a lavish lifestyle? Uh, well, we had carpet in our house. <laughs> uh, we had nice blankets. No, nah, I was um, fortunate to have hardworking parents, and we always had nice, you know, things, whether it be clothes, food, or or like a beautiful home. We've always had that. I've always had that. Mm-hmm. Um, Who are your parents? Um, so my dad's Michael. Mm-hmm. We call him Mickey. Or his, his nickname's Mickey Yahoo. But that's some some of his old school <laughs> story, past life. Uh, Mum, her name's Kori Kori. Uh, and she, well, dad's been, he's a construction worker. So mm-hmm. he's been hard working. He's a farmer boy from where he's from in Martin Borough. He's been working ever since, I don't know, 15, 13. Um, what, what whānau and hapū was uh, Michael from? Jeez, that's a stink question because I can't answer it confidently, but I don't know that. Well, what what like, would you like him to be in? Um, <laughs> well, what, what, what do you know about that, that side? Um, I have, there's a bit of a disconnect there with my family side just because mm. of some of the treatment that happened towards our whānau. Right. Um, yeah, and that's a long way away from here in the Wakathos, um, mm. Martin Burroughs all the way down the other end. Um, so there is a little disconnect there. Mm. Uh, but yeah, my dad's definitely got mouldy roots in him. Mm. He's a hard worker. Um, yeah, hardest worker I know. Mm. Probably beside, he's like going par with uh, Dr. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and what about your mum's side? Uh, mum... Yeah, uh, well connected on mum's side. Fano, uh, iwi. So, we. Oh, so for my mum on her, on Nan's side, it'll be um, Ngati Koroki Kahukura, which where we originated from, and then Nan eventually come to Narawa here, um, and Granddad I think was around this area as well. Um, his last name's a Kirkwood. Mm. Um, and we were being um, sort of more kai, kai mahi for the Kingitanga since back in my nan's days. Our whanau's been a part of the Kingitanga. Um, 
and the Kingi Tonga Arks, they were whanau back then to move down Waiuku, uh, which is closer towards Auckland, to uh, work the land down there. Mm-hmm. And so my nan has a lot of whanau down there as well, which are the tāpuras. Uh, yeah, he big, big whanau on my mum's side. Uh, I'll just say the last names, there's like the Morgans, which I was named after the Morgans. There's the Tāpuras, uh, which is my brother's name. Uh, they're big whanau as well. And then there's the Kirkwoods. Um, and I think, I believe through the Kirkwood line is um, where we connect really close to the royal royal lineage, uh, which, which is pretty complex. I can't <laughs> name that family tree like all the way back up. But right. I know we connect all the way back up to Tafio and Pototo. Mm. Um, yeah, close as ties to Te Puyo. Um My great nan was one of her, I don't know, close friends that worked over at the Marae. Um, so, yeah, Kingi Tanga is really important to um, my mum's side of the whanau. Yeah. So, even within your whakapapa side, you know, serving others has kind of been something that's been passed on from one generation to another. Yeah, yeah, tika there, brother. Yeah, definitely in our in our like lineage in our bloody oranga, I suppose it's in our life that we are Manaki people. Mm. Um, yeah, and our family's been doing this since way back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the stuff that you talked about was being part of a hip hop crew. So if we kind of you know jump back and jump back. Um, and, and focusing on you, what are some of your earliest memories with hip hop and your connection with it? Mm, nah, hip hop, uh, that was a. That was well, a how old were you the was, first time you, you kind of connected with it? I'd say around 13, 14. Mm-hmm. Most likely 13, though, um, on my first year of right. high school. And where were you? I was at high school, and then um, my best friend. What part of New Zealand? Oh, I was in Hamilton. I was mm. in Hamilton. Yeah, Hamilton, you real. And then I first got introduced to hip hop through my best friend. He actually took me up to that youth group that I was speaking about earlier. Mm. And I um, went up the stairs to this, well, to this youth space, and there was a dance studio. And I look into the room, and there's this dude. He had a full Adidas like outfit on, like head to toe, and he was like breakdancing I was like fuck that looks mean as and then I was just intrigued as after that mm. and I felt like I want to go to that studio like all the time or I want to be around that because the music was mean like everyone was just like dancing and stuff and I look cool as so yeah, that's probably my introduction to hip hop who were the big kind of stars or music at that time when you were 13 14 what were you listening to back then Fuck, what was I listening to? Jeez. I think it was like hard out, um, like dub steppy, mm. like that bass hunter mm. stuff. It was techno y. Um, uh, what is it? Is it dub step? Yeah, Tech. Like, yeah, all of that yep. crazy stuff. Um, but in that hip hop space, like it was always old school breaks mm. or old school breakdance. Like, it was quite frowned upon, all of that dubstep stuff, and like, bro, what's that? You can't even dance to that. Mm. When did you realise that actually you could connect with this, with the mm. scene, you know? When did you actually think, actually, this is something I think I could do? I don't know, I just reckon I was, I was pretty decent, eh? Like, right. break dancing, and like... Was it a wider thing, a hanging out or thing? At what point yeah, did you think, actually, I can kind of connect with this on... Think, ah, level. Like, yeah, it was a wide world thing, like, good for the team on as well, but, like, there was that final aspect as well with the crew. Yeah, and what the, describes this crew? Yeah, the, no, the crew was mean as, like, uh, I was introduced to, like, different people, like, I didn't expect myself to have, like, different, like, I had African friends, Asian friends, I've, I've met, like, people from America and Korea mm. and like Brazilian people I danced with heaps of people and created like bonds at a young gay's age and it all happened so quick just from like you know participating and going to events so 
Yeah, that was that was mean. What was uh, one of those events that kind of stands out for you as you reflect back? It would have been my first Red Bull BC one, and I think it was in two thousand and nine. Mm-hmm. I went to my first Red Bull BC one in Auckland. How old were you? I think I was like thirteen, fourteen. Right. And yeah, we we went up to Auckland. I think it was at the um, Zeal. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, ever at that zoo. Far and it was just like, whoa, this is I couldn't believe it. I've never been to a hip hop event, I've only ever been to like our practices and that was always like high pairs and mm. going into that place I was like, Holy hell, there's heaps of people and they all like a mean ass, they were yeah, mean dancers, DJs and stuff, MC like battles. Like, actually seeing real battles for the first time. Like, that was the triggering point for me in hip-hop. Yeah, I couldn't get enough of it. Mm. And you did this for how long? Ah, I've been doing it for ages, like... So, 13, I'm 28 now, far no. Jeez, that's almost 15 years. Like, I like to say I still do it, but I haven't really jammed in a while, so... Mm. But, you know, I'm always a dance, dancer at heart. I'm always a b-boy. I'm always ready for a battle. So if you hear this, no, nah, <laughs> I always like to battle. That's like, I'll never back down from a battle. Mm. Yeah, battles are like the best part of being a people. Right, right. Mm. So you kind of continued on doing this for 15 years. At what point did you decide actually you want to do chefing as a potential career? Uh, I was, um, it was at high school. And then I had to like make a decision. On like a pathway because there was options and classes that we had to choose and I just had to sort of well how I felt as a young person at high school I thought if I need to choose something and stick with it mm. and the reason why I chose chefing is because the cooking class option looked the best because you got a feed <laughs> well it makes so, sense yes yeah, so I was like yeah I'm gonna do that for the feeds and then I just had to run with it after that. Yeah. Mm. And you decided what? So what did you do? You did a course. You, mm. How long was it? What uh, did you learn? So yeah, I've done those classes at high school. I actually don't know if I got any achievements in there or any calls or like. I think I got some NCA credits for like cooking and stuff. So. Right. And then I moved on to Wintec, and I done. First year chefing, and I, mm-hmm. yeah, passed it. I lost all of my gears though, and then I ended up becoming a kitchen hand. And then I was kitchen hand for a long time because I didn't want to be on the pans and all of that. I was quite, I was a little bit frightened right. of actually cooking. I was, I was used to being in the sink anyways. Mm-hmm. With the tea towel. Yeah, with the tea towel and the spray, and then uh, yeah, the machine. <laughs> Yeah, I was a robot. Right. For way too long. And then at some point you got into chefing, yeah? You actually mm. started yeah, so to cook after, for um, After COVID, after our first lockdown... Um, yeah, what was happening with you during COVID? Ah, COVID kicked me, kicked me over. Uh, in what way? It had me isolated in my room. You know, I was like heavy smoking, just playing the game. Um, yeah, for I don't know how long it lasted, I think, but four weeks, didn't it? Well, depending on the region. So Auckland had like six or seven lockdowns. Mm. Yeah, so over here... You were I kind think, of caught between this weird yeah, space. I think we'd done... I'd done a month in my room. Like, I didn't socialise. Oh, other than being on the game with the bros, and it was like, like four or five mm. of the same people for mm. that whole month. Hardly messaging people. Like, rarely went out to go speak to my parents. Like, we were in the same house, but I'd really go out. I'd just right. sit in my room, smoke weed, play the game, and just over and over again. I think I was drinking, but not mm. I was more smoking, really. Mm. Because you were having some isolation, or what was happening with you at the time? Well, just before lockdown, I had a fallout with my cousin, because I, I left my shipping job at Raglan, and then I helped my cousin with his food truck. Mm. Um... And then we had a fam. We had a bit of a fallout because he done. Oh, he didn't agree with something that I done. Right. 
Um, and so he sort of sacked me just before COVID. Well, we've all been sacked. Yeah, and then um, I just Welcome got Welcome to in, the club. Just got in. I was sacked, if it helps. Oh, it was yeah, a customer yeah. service job. I hated it. So, yep, continue. Um, yeah, and then I just got in on the wins and I just cracked um, a little bit of a benefit just before lockdown mm. happened. So payments were coming in, luckily, and I'd just splash it all on bloody munchies and right. weed and maybe a bee just play the game so yeah i was like pretty depressed mm. and then come out of lockdown i was like Fuck, i need to like get up get out of this room and go get a job because mm. i could i knew like that was affecting me like not having something to do mm-hmm. so I started reaching out to people. I ended up, it didn't take me long to get a job, uh, which was at the district um, in Hamilton. It's a cafe type restaurant type thingy. Mm-hmm. And that's where I started um, Yeah, becoming a chef and yeah, being on the pans. It was pretty pretty hard job, actually. It was like six days, six days, one day off. Hard, pretty hard hours. Mm. Um, there'll be a day where I'll be left alone, like there'll be no other chef there, and then I'd have to do, like every section in the kitchen, I'd have to do the fryers, the grill, the pans, the oven, make sure the salads and the burgers and the breads are all getting like, for service, like, yeah, and there'll be some services where I had to hold it down. Um, but now I think I've done a mean ass job as like a first experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I reckon I've done a mean. I know that, that uh, my boss, my boss was said that I left, but it had to be done because at the end of that job, it was traffic light system for COVID. Yes, yes. And that was sort of smoking hospitality, uh, hospitality, hospitality. Mm. Uh, she sat us all down on our stuff and she said she could only pay us for another two weeks. Wow. Um, and you'd been there for how long? I was there... Like at least a, a year or right. so. Right. Maybe two, but yeah. And then I said, oh, sweet fire, you know, I'm gonna start looking for a job. And then my old mate that I used to work with, which is, uh, his name's Harm Yoda, mm. he reached out to me and he said, hey, bro, I'm assembling a team. And I was like, wow, what a what a buzzy timing. Because I was like just starting to go out and look for another job. And he, he just blessed me with that message. And then he had an interview not long after that. And then I cracked it. Yeah, and I've been there ever since. And it's a great message, right? I'm assembling a team. It sounds like Avengers, kind of. Yeah, that's what, where he was coming from. He was like, I'm assembling the Avengers, bro. What one do you want to be? And I said, Black Widow. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I was in Black Widow. Oh, no. And what was it that you kind of thought that this mucky was about? What did you... Did you have any kind of thoughts? Um, so the bro told me that it was going to be um, nothing like Te Ahure, because Te Ahure were, you know, reckon with kids in schools. Mm. Mm. And um, he said these kids have been getting into trouble and they actually have um, criminal charges and... You know, there's a lot of hard work. It's going to be different, and I understood sort of the assignment. And mm. I was like, yeah, so these kids are at risk. I could tell, yeah, it was going to be a challenge. Um, some hardened kids yeah. that I'm not quite used to. I'm quite used to, like, being in schools, and they all, like, sit properly, and they listen, and they're all happy, and this and that. Um, but it's all right. Uh, kids will be kids, I suppose, mm. yeah. I was happy to just be able to get back into that space after being away for so long. Yes. Mm. And some of those kids that you're talking about, they come from quite extreme, yep. you know, you know, backgrounds. What was some of the, you know, that you feel comfortable sharing? What was some of the first experiences you ever had of, of seeing or experiencing violence? Was it in the workplace? Was it at school? Where, where was some of the stuff that you kind of think about? Um, I could probably start like at home mm. um, with my older brother he had schizoph- he's got schizophrenia and he attacked my mum one time right um, that was probably like a big 
first sort of violent thing that I've really encountered. Mm. Um, mm. And then, you know, going through my teenage years, being around my other brother, um, there's always there was always stories of violence that he'd share. Or, right. Like, I understood that I was close and that I was taught to, you know, be very wary of, of your surroundings. And, you know, I felt that growing up and I was thinking, you know, this is real... This felt more true for me being a Maori. I felt like it was it would, it's always around Maori people. Mm. Um, that's just what we're taught, I suppose, to sort of keep your guard up and you know if it goes down, it goes down type stuff. So I understand that part about it. Um, violence in a workspace. Um, I suppose like Sheffield sort of showed me some of that stuff too because it'll get quite angry. Yeah, so mentioned. some people don't know that I actually trained as a chef. Mm. Um, and actually chefs can be really aggressive mm. yeah, and yeah. swear and yell. And the ones that I knew um, back in the Sheridan up in Auckland, they used to throw knives yeah, at nah, people yeah. if the food was sent back. Yeah, nah, those, there's well, some chefs that are quite pretty gnarly. Um, like even, nah, yeah, chefing's pretty gnarly. The language is gnarly. Uh, um, yeah, they're throwing stuff, I think. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, I felt violent in my shifting days. Like, there's times where I was in the sink, I had my mate didn't show up. I'm, I'm over there shucking like 10 kgs of mussels, and then the, like, there's hella dishes piling up, and I just felt angry and then the manager comes in, it was an Italian lady and then she's like going off of my ear. Then I started, you know, getting a little bit more rough with the dishes and then mm. she's like, yeah, she's not saying the right things as a manager, I felt anyways. And then, then I had to step out and have a smoke and then she's coming out and she's like trying to bloody step it to me. And I'm mm. like, lady, don't, <laughs> like, you don't want that. Like, jeez. I'll go in there and smash that kitchen up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, in, the, in the youth space though, is stepping into this job, yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of violence, especially in these kids' like, mm. lives. And, you know, they're coming from gang backgrounds and, yeah, just like abusive, abusive backgrounds. Mum and dad sort of, you know, definitely in their violent space um yeah even in the workspace like kids have you know got got into fights you know escalating over like dumb things mm -hmm. like board games right and then like tables are getting chucked chairs are getting chucked you know if hands are getting thrown um but yeah i'm going on i'm going on no, 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 you can, by all means go on there, Hikoi. So, you know, given that you're working with rangataki with complex needs, what are some of the strategies that you do mm. as kaimaki to kind of work with our our young ones? Um, well, routine, I feel like, in our fight, because these kids ain't used to routine. Mm. So that's a bit of a shock to them. Uh, that's definitely a strategy because it helps them focus on the next thing instead of like wandering around and then like I don't know feeling frustrated and stuff so we always talk to them clearly about what's happening next mm -hmm. um, definitely use Māori tikonga we always karakia open our day um, around the table whether it be kai we do karakia um, we might do karakia when things are you know feeling a bit tense um, we always come together we use whānau like strategies whānau like aspect type things when mm -hmm. we come together and we talk at the end of the day every day mm -hmm. um, we give them space to talk about the highlights or the lowlights and so we open up that space and they're not familiar with that stuff right um, about letting things go and talking about things um, so I think that's an important thing that we do so communicate yeah yeah communicate for sure um, otherwise, if they're not talking about their days and the things that sort of make them hoha, it's going to bottle up and then they're going to start punching things and, mm. and start hurting people, uh, which they're too used to. They're not used to letting it out. Yeah. Yeah. 
So for you, you were saying that uh, routine helps communication, mm -hmm. giving them a space. How easy is it for, for our young ones to kind of open up about what's happening with them? Um, it's pretty hard. Like, it takes them a while to sort of get familiar with that, um, that, that talking thing and, mm. and letting it out, like, in an open space with, like, everyone there. Yeah. Well, what about yourself? How easy is it for you to open up? You know, if you're working with our yeah. Taki, it's kind of setting an example. How easy is it for you to kind of open up when, when things get a bit hard? Uh, no, I feel, I feel all right. Um, and our hoogies at the end of the day, like, we, I'm pretty open with mm -hmm. things that ain't right. I'll, I'll tell the whole, everyone really, not just the young people, I'll tell the staff and I'll make sure they hear as well. Yeah. Um, if things ain't right. Um, I do struggle though to um, sort of pull individuals aside and tell them like, or be sort of firm with stuff that needs to be said. Mm -hmm. um, I think I feel more comfortable like, speaking out to the room yes about and not point to anyone out because i feel a little bit distinct like making i don't know like yes yeah, sort of coming off like a bully or not a bully like like i'm picking on them or mm. something or like mm. what yeah i don't want to be the bad guy in any story really. right <laughs> but you can't always have that yeah mm. And so in what way do you apply, you know, what, what are some of the strategies that you apply yourself when you're feeling a bit hoha or a bit awanga wanga, a bit upset? Um, well, I'll be honest, brother, if I at home, like, my space is well needed. Yes. Like, my game is well needed. I've got, got that PC now, so now playing, jumping on Discord and talking to the bros. Mm. Um, definitely I'll be not really a smoke these days it used to be a smoke mm. it used to be a bit of a um bit of a weed but nah for some maybe but for me like not really these days yeah i'm more of a sit down have a beer and have a talk um listen to music in what way do you find it beneficial talking to the boys mm. especially if you're uh, gaming like what kind of what kind of court it or is it just a general catch up? Is it just a focusing on the, the task at hand? Is it? Nah, it's cool with the boys because they just like, yo, know, they acknowledge it and they'll give their piece of advice and they'll be like serious about yeah. it. But then they're quickly, like, it'll switch and it'll become like, they could even just shut that whole thing and like, but that's dumb anyways. And then we just sort of laugh about it and it's like, fine, true. Uh, yeah. Do you think that the way that our Tane communicate is different to our Wakini? And if so, in what way? Um, I think boys are better at like balancing the chord. It'll, they'll have a part serious, part serious, and then they'll come over and then there'll be breakaway humour. Yes. And then, but we sort of like, in that serious space, it's like, did we learn about it? Like, do you got it? Yup, yeah, yup, yeah, sweet. Yeah, and then we'll go have a laugh and then you yeah, forget about it type thing, but we make sure that we sort of understand, like, you know, the solution or, or you know, some wis wisdom that needed to be said. Mm. So make sure that's locked in, then we'll just carry on, have a laugh and, yeah, the balance. And then, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the girls, like, they might, um, well, I'm just thinking about how I would speak. Mm. Um, some some girls um that tension might be left too long in the convo or the corridor and there might not be like that fucking awe that i feel like i have with the boys it might be sort of like not enough humor but there was too much serious and now it's getting a bit sad now yes a bit pody yeah 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 and it's like like moving forward but like finding the solution in the cordial but then moving forward with like mm. a, a positive so I don't know what was the balance what was the best advice you've ever been given by one of the boys when you were going through a hard time um no probably just solid reminders and reassurance that you know I'm the man type thing you know that heaps of bruise look up to me mm. and, you know they yeah they just remind me I think that you know I'm all good I'm a good fella type thing and, mm. you know, I think that's important for the brothers for all the brothers if 
you ain't getting told that, brothers. Hey, you need to find some people that tell you that stuff because, brothers, it's uplifting when you get told that mm. stuff. And it sort of just mounts the worries away, being reminded mm. that you're like your own, you know, your love and all that stuff. How often are you reminded? Um, Not enough? Uh, like, <laughs> just about, you yeah, know, like Goldie like Locks, is it just people, right? But right. Uh, I, I, get, I get uplifted. I, yeah, I feel like I'm getting enough but you know, there's always room for more fun so, <laughs> yeah pop a DM send me some love <laughs> so for you do you feel like you have like a genuine group of people that monarch you through the good times and the bad yeah you yeah, have definitely my gaming clan like the bros um, they're called Alter all of the above uh, I've always got my brother there um, mum and dad's always huge my partner's mm. huge she always reassures me that I'm, you know, doing a good job at Mahi when things get tough. Um, yeah, but just, I stick really tight to, like, mainly those people. Mm. Really. Mm. My best friend. Yeah. Mind you, he hardly even speaks, but... Yeah, he always reminds me that I'm the man, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he has presence, I imagine. Yeah, Just nah, his presence nah, being nah, there. Nah. There's something about the quiet ones that I like because I always wonder what is it that they're thinking when everybody else is, mm. you know, cordial, cordial. But the the quiet ones are the ones that kind of look in the room, do some observation. Those are the ones I tend to kind of want to get to know a bit more because they're a bit reserved. Yeah. Um, you know, f- for the for your for your clients, you know, for your family that you're working with, what what do you find is quite effective? Do you use any resources or tools to help uplift them? What do you do? Um, at work? Yeah. Uh, probably be like... Oh, we got a flash house finally where I work. It's a remand home, but it's a bloody mansion. We got a pool. Like, I like to utilise the pool. Mm. We got a gym. Sometimes that's not their buzz, but I do like to utilise that. Um, like... The privileges that are around the house is a, a good tools that I like to use um, to create sort of space with these kids, mm-hmm. whether it be the game or just chilling, watching TV. Um, I like to engage with them with the games. we got board games and all of that. Um, I like teaching them graffiti as well, like bombing and stuff mm-hmm. on the book. Um, what else do I use? You know, we get into the kitchen every now and then. I like to use food as a bit of a, you know, connector. Um, whether it be, I don't know, baking mm. or just like teaching them basic cooking skills. Um, yeah, the kitchen's a good one. Food's always, I think, the best connector. Yes. Um, I think it's a nice way of kind of connecting people. Yeah, I feel like. Yeah, it's, I think it's a vulnerable space while you're eating. It's, mm. Yeah, eating's mean. <laughs> it's the meanest. Uh. And, it, and for me, it's that way of kind of transferring people that are kind of tapu into noa is the sharing of kai. Yeah, yeah, that, that part. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. Mm. Um, th- thinking about the way that you're, you, you look after yourself and for people that are listening to this, what are some of the strategies that you use to kind of take care of yourself when no one else is around and you might be feeling a bit uh, wanga wanga, a bit pony Fa it might not be good for you but for I lay there in bed and I scroll on the bloody YouTube reels and right. I watch Fortnite I watch games um, play the game maybe sit down with my partner have a drink have a laugh hmm. um, it might be play with the kids um, you know, because kids are crack up. My partner's got two uh, twins. Oh, she's got an older girl as well. Uh, but the twins, father, crack up. <laughs> Just the stuff they say. And, like, I feel like that's a good way mm-hmm. for me. Like, just being around kids mm-hmm. and sort of hearing the things they say, sort of like, fuck, that don't make no sense. Like, and it just takes everything away from the world. It's like, wow, nothing even really matters in the world to these kids. They're just here in the moment. They're just cracking up. Mm. And they've been around that energy. It's like, takes the worry away, I feel. Yes. 
Yeah. So tapping back into that kind of innocence, that potential space. Mm, yeah, huh? Like, you know, to them, nothing, or none of this stress that I'm feeling, all of these problems, it's like nothing. So I'm just like, I'm trying to get back to that. Yeah. And sort of have a moment to forget about things and just be yeah. there. Because it's interesting, isn't it? As we get older, we want to be an adult, and then when we hit an adult, we want to go back into that childhood. Yeah, <laughs> hard, hard, fast. Um, what What do you think the next couple of years might look like for you moving forward? So you're a homeowner now. Yeah. So you got serious commitments. I'm actually not too sure, but I do. I want to be a business owner as well. Mm. I wanted to create a business. Um, it was going to be car detailing, but. I've been talking about it for too long, I need to do it. Um, but some type of business anyways where you can generate money for myself and my fans. Mm. Um, yeah, and continue to work in um, health, whatever that may be. Mm. Uh, so I think that's what I'm aligned to, uh, helping and supporting people. Still was the Rangatahi or potentially in other spaces? Yeah, I'm open to it. I, my family's... You know, worked in all all of the spaces. I feel like, mm. yeah, adults and all of that. Well, not all of them, but I feel like I can do like yeah, anything really, yeah, anything in the health space. What kind of gives you the most joy working in those spaces? Mm, like just be just moving, I suppose, or meeting new people, going places. I, I like conferences. You do? Yeah, I do, I do. I like conferences. Um, and my favourite part's the eating. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but no, I do like conferences and learning. Uh, that was that festival of the future. Oh, yeah. you know, that was a cool one. Like I've done that one. That's what people tend to focus on, you know, conferences. Isn't what they've learned when they give feedback. It's the food, and yeah, whether they like yeah. it or not. Having... Yeah. Having been in charge of a number of conferences and events, that, that's the thing that they give the most feedback on, yeah, not yeah, not yeah. not the presenters, yeah. not what they've learned, but that the the kai was too cold, too hot, not enough. So I, I love it. I love it. Just listening to you. Yeah, nah. yeah. <laughs> but I like gala conferences. Even just sitting there for those workshops, I think me. And for some of our bros that are listening to this, what what would be your kind of advice that you would give them if they are feeling a bit down, you know, looking for options, not wanting to hurt other people, you know, or maybe even hurting themselves? What what would you say? Fuck, I don't know. Hey, like, hang out with someone you hang out with all the ages. Like, they will have a different perspective. I reach out to people that you haven't spoken to in ages. I don't know, um... Go back to the Urupa, maybe far something different, something mm. you don't really do, but it's do something different. Um, you know, you might be going, and you might be in this routine. Mm. You know, think about these things. Think about things that you ain't doing in your routine. It could be the small things. It could be a walk. It could be a um, if I haven't been speaking to this person. Like I just been walking past them all this all these days, and you know, have a stop, stop, have a talk. You might see like you might be catching a bus every day or something. You might see this person on your on your journey and your routine. But have a chat with that person. He might drop the bomb on you, and you might just like have the meanest day ever after that, because you you made that change and you had a bit of a yarn with that random fella that was always there on the bus or mm-hmm. they do something different. I reckon, brothers. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well. That, that sounds like a really good way to uh, stop right now, but no doubt there'll be like a part two more, Kina, mm. in terms of looking at where to from here, how do we look after ourselves. So thank you, brother. really appreciate your time in Modi. Now, mihi. Modi order, brother. Thank you, brother. Dr. Alex. <laughs> Dr. Alex, the man. This podcast has been brought to you today by StandingTollNZ.org.